My name is Robert Jan Wille, historian of science and politics. Let me start with a question. How important to you are the sciences and the humanities? Probably your answer is, yes, they are important. So next question, who should pay for them? Not many of you say science is a hobby no one should pay for. More people would say, let the market and industry pay for it. However, most of you, either fearing corporate interests or more generally, afraid of losing support for not directly useful science, would say, the responsibility belongs to the state. And indeed, in history it is the modern state who has become the main funding body of universities, academies and national science foundations. Although always in cooperation or competition with the market. So here is the final question. Are you not afraid then just that just like the market, the state will interfere in research and education? No, you might say. In a democracy, the state will not want to do that, because if it does so, the people will loudly protest or vote away interfering politicians. But here it becomes interesting, because in history, that is not the way it has worked for most of the time. Leaving aside for now the specific relationship between science and democracy, there has always been a deep and complex relationship between science and the nation state in general, democratic or not. Historians and sociologists of science, such as Sheila Jasanov, Theodore Porter, and John Pickstone, have again and again demonstrated that the growth of scientific disciplines contributed to the expansion of the state, but also that the emergence of the modern state produced new scientific ways of knowing. Well, for me, the big question is, what kind of states produced what kind of sciences? And in order to answer these kind of questions, we need to map and compare different sciences in different states in the modern period. But in order to do this, we need to get rid of a myth first. We tend to think science is a pure activity that gets corrupted when there's outside interference. Think how the National Socialist war machine turned Darwinian science into extremely abusive blood and soil pseudoscience. Think of the way how the Stalinist regime got rid of evolutionary genetics because it did not fit well into Marxist ideology. And think about the racist science produced by colonial empires and slave states. But these are extreme examples that only show that the totalitarian states produced totalitarian science. Actually, historians of science have shown that also in normal periods and in moderate regimes, science is connected to two realities. Natural reality at the one hand and social reality at the other. Science is both a product of natural surroundings and local, national and global politics. The idea of the pure scientist is a myth, because science has never been an autonomous activity. Think about the golden age of the so-called fundamental sciences, the decades immediately after the Second World War, with the American military heavily investing billions in nuclear physics, astronomy, engineering, molecular biology and the social sciences. And before the wars, in the 19th century, modern empires increasingly contributed to big sciences such, such as the agricultural sciences, meteorology and geography. These new sciences depended on the state. Let's finish with an example. Let's take a look at the development of biology in the Dutch Empire, one of my research subjects. Around 1800, the French state invested in imperial museums with large halls and storerooms, creating the new field of comparative anatomy. The German states in university laboratories making new forms of cell biology possible. The British state in a world system of botanical gardens and naval expeditions contributing to the emergence of evolutionary theory and the United States in agricultural departments making space for genetics. Each state contributed to new traditions in biology. 
Now the new Dutch Kingdom of 1813 was a small state that needed to re-establish some authority in Europe. And what do small states do well? Creating new things through copying and mediating between the larger powers. First, around 1800, the Dutch copied French museums and British colonial botanical gardens. That all went well, but it only became interesting when halfway the 19th century, the Dutch state started to fund German-style university labs. Then Germans and Dutch were able to produce together new forms of developmental biology based on decades of taxonomic practice in the museums and the colonies. And around 1900, when the United States Department for Agriculture became the new applied science model, biologists in Java, in the Dutch Indies, used American and other foreign visitors to become a global research center for tropical agriculture in the Pacific. And this research center, in turn, contributed to the Dutch Indies increasingly turning into a technocracy, a colony ruled by agricultural experts. Okay, enough biology. Now you may wonder, what about the humanities? Especially our own field of history has never been a big government science, you might think. Well, think again. The rise of the humanities in Europe, as Jo Tollebeek, Rens Bot, and Joop Leersen, among many others, have shown, has very much depended on the foundation and development of state archives. Think about that next time when you do archival research in The Hague, Brussels, Paris, Berlin or London. Thank you.